there. Um, always displays the host or speaker. Um, the polling questions, if we do those, we do have a couple today. Uh, the Q&A box is also always available and the chat box is there. Those items are accessible on the buttons on the bottom of your screen. Please take a look at those right now. The blue button in the middle with a question mark is the Q&A. You probably have another blue button that has a little um, cartoon balloon in it. That is the chat box, so that's how you get to that. Some of the others just indicate whether you're joining by phone or other ways. And we're done today. You'll hit the red button with an X to exit or leave our broadcast. So there's your control panel. Please make sure you have um, taken a look at that and are ready to use it. And Anne Marie, if I could interject, um, some people that have an updated version, the chat may be in the far right bottom corner. If you don't see it in the center, it may be in the far right bottom corner. Good to know. Also, a reminder on the chat, be sure when you send something that you send your chat message to either all participants or all panelists, depending on what you have on your drop down menus. That way, everyone can share in the information that we'll be doing with our activities. So let's get started with today's agenda. Because we're doing cell, we're looking we're going to be using the three signature practices of cell for our agenda and for our broadcast today. Those three practices are the welcoming and inclusion activities, engaging pedagogy and practices, and an optimistic closure. As you can see, um, number one and number three are very brief, of course, because it's a sort of a start and a, and a close out. In the middle, our engaging pedagogy and practices today are going to take a look at the North Carolina social emotional plan overall, as well as the cell competencies with integrating cell in the world languages classroom. So let's get started. The first signature practice is a welcoming or inclusion activity. The pr purpose of a welcoming inclusion activity is to set the tone for learning. And obviously we're doing that for adults today because we're all adult learners today or educators. Um, but we also do that when we're in the classroom with students or even across the whole school when working with students. Notice that I have a picture of the cell three signature practices uh, for adults and for the classroom. Those are documents that are um, drawn from all of the cell resources we have for you today and that are on your participants notes. But I want to take a close look at that so that you'll kind of know what's there. Obviously, when we're going to set the tone for learning and we're going to have a welcoming or inclusion activity, it's something to draw everyone together and make sure they're ready to learn whatever the content is. It's also to make sure that they feel included and welcome in the setting. Um, and that gives them uh, oftentimes the confidence they need to voice uh, their concerns, their questions, and to be more actively involved in learning. Our welcoming inclusion activity is a poll. I'd like to know from where are you joining us today? Uh, you see all across our state, we have different regions. Um, those are defined by our legislature as economic development zones, as well as by our State Board of Education, because we have representation from each of those eight regions on our State Board of Education. Of course, you might also be in another state right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch that poll, and you can indicate where you are joining us from today. All right, on your control panel, that poll should be there and you can go ahead and click in your answer and tell us where you're joining us from today. Please take a careful look. You may be joining us from a home office, um, your school office, your classroom or someplace else. Notice that one of the things WebEx gives us is a timer. And I know we can answer this question quickly. So we have um, about 25 seconds left to go for everyone to get their answers in. I also see some people put some details on specifically which county in the chat box. Thank you for that. Looks like we've got somebody from Currituck County. All right. So let's take a look at our results so that you can see them too. It looks like we have people from several different regions, almost all of our regions, in fact. Um, we have a few people from the uh, southeastern inner and outer coastal coast. Um, 
over 10 people from the North Central region, one person from the Sand Hills, uh, five people from the Piedmont Triad region today, uh, one from Southwest Metrolina, one from, oh, nope, three from the Northwestern Blue Ridge Mountains, and three also from another, from the Western Blue Ridge Mountains. And finally, um, there's a couple people from another state. So welcome to everyone. Uh, we're going to be talking about a lot of things today regarding cell and world languages. And I hope you'll get some information that you can take back to your classroom and use for yourself as an adult learner, um, use for your colleagues, because I know you may be here gathering this information to take back to your department or, or your PLC, and use for your students in the classroom. All right. So that leads to our second signature practice where we talk about engaging pedagogy and practices. And this is uh, where we talk about sense making transitions and brain breaks, of course. Um, today, I want to kind of show you some of that um, from the materials we've shared with you on the participants notes. You see some examples of that from the classroom for students as well as examples for adult learners. And so um, engaging pedagogy and practices and those transitions that we do with students involve things like activities where you have interaction of some kind. Um, where you might do a think pair share or think each pair share if you've tried that before. Where you might get people think time uh, or to turn to a partner or someone that they're working with. And so I've tried to choose some activities for us today that we'll get a little bit of interaction, um, but also where you can use these if you're working online with your learners or working face to face or even in a blended or virtual env environment. So let's talk about our North Carolina cell plan. Um, here's sort of an overall of where we started. You can see that this is labeled 2019 and 2020. But at the heart of our NC cell implementation team are three main groups. First of all, the Department of Public Instruction that we're coming to you from today, um, but also our Department of Health and Human Services for North Carolina and district representatives from across the state. I mentioned my name is Anne-Marie Gunter. I'm the World Languages Consultant for the state, and I'm in Standards Curriculum and Instruction at the Department of Public Instruction. Cynthia Floyd, who's here with me, um, is also from Standards Curriculum and Instruction uh, with School Counseling. And Elaine Darby is here with us, um, and she is from Communications and providing us support today for our Facebook Live broadcast. So those are the groups involved in our NC cell implementation team on behalf of our teachers um, and administrators across the state. Also, you notice on the left hand side there in the 2019 some cross division collaboration. So North Carolina joined Castle's Collaborating States Initiative and formed a cross agency and cross division team that I just explained there in the middle. One thing to know is that CASEL stands for Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. So you see that CELL is involved there, but it also includes academics and the fact that it's a collaborative group. That group um, reflected on our current statewide implementation of CELL and created an NC CELL implementation plan um, and worked with um, a resource map for CELL as well as across NCDPI with different division directors like the Division Director for Standards Curriculum and Instruction. In 2020, obviously, we um, started putting some resources out that you're familiar with and we're going to talk about more today. Um, the cell standards mapping documents are available in all of the areas you see listed there. Of course, we're talking about world languages today, but you see there's a number of them available. And again, all of those are linked on your participants notes, too, so you can always get to any of the ones that you want. In addition, some other resources are the online courses that you may be interested in. There's a course cell practices course, as well as cell for educators at the Friday Institute from North Carolina State University. So there's some other resources as well, but that's the main overall picture for our NC cell implementation team and our NC cell plan as it got underway. As we move forward, we have four focus areas for our NC cell implementation plan, as you can see here. Um, the first is obviously build foundational support and plan. The second is to strengthen adult cell competencies and capacity. And that's very important because as adults um, in the classroom, in the school, in the district, we want to make sure we understand cell competencies and are using those cell competencies and making sure we build our own social emotional learning practices um, while we consider doing that for students. Of course, the third focus area is to promote cell for students. And the fourth is always to use data for continuous improvement. 
Just so you know, this school year, the 2020-2021 school year, has some key activities that we've been working on. Over the summer, we did a number of things, um, including launching the three signature practices and releasing those cell standards mapping resources for the 12 content areas that we're going to uh, focus in on the World Languages one today. Um, this fall, we've been working on getting more voices, including student voices in our cell vision. We've been working on our communication plan and developing cell knowledge across DPI. We're also going to launch the NC Cell website soon, probably later this fall. And we've done some other things with hosting uh, virtual conferences. In the winter, um, we'll release the professional culture online course and do some other things that continue to roll out resources and materials for you to use uh, in your classroom and with your colleagues as you build your capacity with Cell. And finally, in the spring, we'll be launching a Cell module for our DPI staff. So that's our overall plan and what we're focused on this school year. So let's begin at the beginning then. What is CELL? We all know it stands for social emotional learning, which is good. But CELL is a process. And it's a process by which children and adults, so people of any age, um, do these things listed here. Develop healthy identities, understand and manage their emotions. Makes sense with the, the E for emotional learning there in CELL. Uh, set and achieve positive goals feel and show empathy, uh, establish and maintain positive relationships, and make responsible and caring decisions. And many of the things we're going to talk about with CELL, of course, as educators we've known about and worked with our learners on for a number of years in different ways. But CELL comes to bring, brings it all together, as I said, as a process for us to think about more comprehensively. Notice also that the CELL core competencies, those five items you see uh, in orange, yellow, and green, are surrounded by all the work that goes into our classrooms and making sure that our curriculum instruction with CELL and with our content is what it needs to be. Um, around that is all the work we do at, at the school level and our school-wide practices and policies. And finally, of course, everything is encapsulated in what happens in our homes and communities and how we work with family and community partnerships. One of the things that people always ask is, what are the benefits of CELL? Well, there are several main benefits that are really attractive not only to teachers, but to everyone. Um, first of all, CELL um, leads to better academic performance. It also leads to improved attitudes and behaviors, less negative behaviors, and reduced emotional stress. These are all positive aspects and benefits of CELL that um, are helpful for everyone. One thing to think about why do sell is this quote here from the Applebaum Training Institute. I'll give you a moment to just read through that yourself. So that sort of sums up why do sell. We all know that to effectively use our skills and our talents and our learning, we have to be able to socially and emotionally handle things that happen, manage our emotions, um, do some conflict resolution, see to handle stress of things. And that's become even more important this school year, I think, with all the challenges and changes and transitions that we've gone through. So here's our activity. We're going to talk about our cell core competencies, those five items, like I said, that are in the center of our cell process logo, um, self-awareness, self-management, responsible decision-making, relationship skills, and social awareness. What we're going to do for activity is um, you're going to get to read a definition that appears here on the right-hand side of our screen. And then I want you to type in the chat to all, either all participants or all panelists, which one of the cell core competencies it is. Now, obviously, there's only five. So if you want to make an abbreviation for yourself for each one, get ready to do that. But we're going to look at the official definition from the CASEL's work um, and our cell core competency documents and resources that you have access to on your participants' notes. So here we go. And Cynthia is behind the scenes helping me watch what happens in the chat. So here's our first definition. The ability to successfully regulate one's emotions, thoughts, and behaviors in different situations. Effectively managing stress, controlling impulses, and motivating oneself. The ability to set and work toward personal and academic goals. Go ahead, type into chat to all which of the cell core competencies on the left that definition belongs to. Hey, 
And Anne Marie, we've already got several responses of people saying they believe this is self management and they are also correct. self awareness. All right. Self management is correct. Thank you to everyone who typed that in quickly. We had a few abbreviations, but others are fast typers in general. All right, so that's self management. Next up is the ability to make constructive choices about personal behavior and social interactions based on ethical standards, safety concerns, and social norms. The realistic evaluation of consequences of various actions and a consideration of the well being of oneself and others. What does that define? And you have a lot of entries of responsible decision making. Yep, and that is the answer, responsible decision making. Great. Next up is the ability to take the perspective of and empathize with others, including those from diverse backgrounds and cultures. The ability to understand social and ethical norms for behavior and to recognize family, school and community resources and supports. And we evidently have the gifted group with us today. They were already entering social awareness before you could finish reading. <laughs> Very good. That is social awareness. All right, here we go. The ability to accurately recognize one's own emotions, thoughts and values and how they influence behavior. The ability to accurately assess one's strengths and limitations with a well-grounded sense of confidence, optimism and a growth mindset. You are correct. I see all of the chat box filling up with self-awareness. Great. Thank you. And the last one, and this is the easy one now, because you can see we've eliminated the ups, is the ability to establish and maintain healthy and rewarding relationships with diverse individuals and groups. The ability to communicate clearly, listen well, cooperate with others, resist inappropriate social pressure, negotiate con conflict constructively, and seek and offer help when needed. Obviously, that relationship skills. Great. Thank you so much. One thing I'll let you know, um, I like to color code things because I will be sharing these slides afterwards if you need to use them. And so all the things you do, you see me doing here, for example, color coding to match the wheel that's in the middle, um, you will have access to those materials and we'll continue to use that color coding as we dig into the cell mapping document for world languages. Because all of these definitions that you've seen here, also have a more specific definition from this perspective of world language education. And that's one of the things we're exploring today. So let's take a look. Our cell examples for the world language essential standards, our state standards, um, is a simple document you see there. I want to emphasize that it is examples from our world language essential standards. So there are just some examples to get you started, but there are many more things you can explore and you might find other examples from our state standards too that fit these areas. So our cell examples for our world language essential standards can be downloaded from the standards tab on our world languages website. It obviously has in it the five cell core competencies for language learning. So those core competency definitions we just went over, as I said, there's a more specific version from the perspective of world language education contained in this document. There are also lessons and activities to be done in the target language that you're teaching. And these lessons and activities are drawn and shared from a lot of different content areas, but they have been selected based on our state standards and the kinds of things we do in the classroom with students in the target language so that they can build their language skills. In addition, there are teaching practices, things that we do as educators in the classroom and when we're around students in general in the school and in the community to reinforce good cell core competencies in language learning and to help students practice that and become savvy with the cell process. Here's a couple of snapshots from our document just so you can see how this is. Um, when, when we talk about the lessons and activities, there's a whole section for each core competency. This is a snapshot of the one for self-awareness. And you can see these lessons and activities with the reminder that they're done in the target language. And then there's a whole list of them um, about what you can do. And again, these are just examples to get you started. You may have more that you want to add. Right after that, for each cell core competency, um, you have a snapshot 
of the teaching practices. And again, these are just some basic things to do. Many of these things we already do as with the lessons and activities, but they're just a reminder about how those reflect good practices with cell, the cell process. Finally, one of the things I want to really emphasize with you is that with any um, kind of mapping document for our standards, the point is to help us see how what we're already doing in the classroom um, is ingrained in, in what we build our curriculum on, which is our state standards. So as part of our standards and the local curriculum written for it, we already teach either directly or indirectly the components of cell we're going to talk about today. So, for example, communication, and obviously for our world language essential standards, our first three essential standards are about communication. It's an important part of the cell process. Respect for others and empathy are also components of the cell process that are important and reflected in our state standards, particularly with the fourth essential standard, which is culture. In addition, we always teach decision making, teamwork, and cooperation. Sometimes that's part of our routine in the classroom and other times it's directly from our standards and the clarifying objectives where we want students to be interacting for different purposes with the language and making sure that they can do that effectively. So that's already in our standards. Now I wanted to show you um, when it came to the cell mapping document how thorough it is that we've tried to look at our standards and clarifying objectives and make sure that those are reflected through standards, through strands, and through the proficiency levels or outcomes in our standards. So out of our 200 some clarifying objectives in the state standards, 88 of those have been mapped from our World Language Essential Standards or WLES document, with the examples that you see in this cell document. And specifically, I wanted to share this chart with you. It's kind of overwhelming when you first look at it, but really what this shows is that for each proficiency level or proficiency outcome that we have in our standards and that you teach to so that your students build that proficiency in the language they're learning, we have made sure that there are clarifying objectives for each of the cell core competencies. So if you look down through that, you get to see for self-awareness how many objectives for novice low, novice mid, novice high, et cetera, that there are. Uh, and that's for all five core competencies. You can see on the right hand side the total of the number of objectives by proficiency level. Notice, by the way, that there are more for the lower proficiency levels like novice low, novice mid, novice high. That's for two very simple reasons. Number one is um, we have more objectives um, at those levels because of the way language learning works. But number two is those are the main areas that we see people teaching courses. So a lot of the courses that we teach uh, begin at the beginning with novice low proficiency and build from there. And we do have students who certainly go up through advanced mid, the highest level of proficiency that you can achieve in a K-12 world language program. Um, but there are fewer and there are fewer objectives when you get up to that level. So this kind of gives you an overview of how well integrated um, CELL has always been in our standards. Um, but we're going to take a look at some examples and, and call some things out specifically so that we understand more effectively how to integrate that in the classroom work that we do. Here are just some screenshots of what you'd find in the document related to our different proficiency levels. So we have it broken out by proficiency level. This one is novice high, which is where students are usually working when they're in like a level two high school course, let's say, or um, they've been several years studying a language maybe at the elementary or middle school. And so you see that we have all the novice high clarifying objectives specifically for the different cell core competencies so you can look at them that way. Here's another screenshot with a little bit higher level proficiency, intermediate high proficiency, and it's arranged the same way. All right, so when we talk about our world language essential standards, one of the things that we have emphasized in the cell mapping document for our, our area is that world languages and biliteracy curriculum is enhanced when it's intentional about developing social and emotional learning core competencies or cell competencies. Obviously, we know that, but just like our cell, our um, mapping document for global education, we also know that those are some things that we emphasize in the classroom um, intentionally and unintentionally, but it's always good to look at them carefully and um, consider what they really bring to us when we think about the perspective of cell core competencies. 
Here's a screenshot. You're probably familiar with this. It's from our administrator guides for world languages that kind of shows how our standards weave together. So we have our four essential standards in a personal communication, interpretive communication, presentational communication and culture. And they're woven through with our three strands about connections to language and literacy, connections to other disciplines and communities. So again, I've done a chart just so you can kind of get a view of how these are integrated. So the example uh, clarifying objectives that we've picked for the cell process from our standards um, cut across all of our essential standards, um, all of our strands, and you can see kind of what the totals are. I'll pause for a moment on that chart and just see if we have any questions or anything that are coming in about this basic information I've shared um, regarding the cell mapping document for world languages. And Marie, I'm not seeing any questions at this time um, unless people are entering them in the two box that I can't view. But uh, for those that are entering it where I can view, I'm not seeing any questions at this time. Okay, great. Well, one thing to think about, and the reason I put these charts together is to always consider, you know, are things spread out um, over time, like we looked at with the different proficiency levels, so that you know you have um, different objectives that you're teaching that already bring in cell, even if you're teaching beginning learners. But another way to think about this is, where in our standards does cell really get emphasized? And obviously you see it's spread out throughout all of our standards and our strands, but notice that the culture standard number four, as well as the community strand, um, seems to be the place where quite a few cell components come out. Not a big surprise given what the cell process is about and how important culture and communities and connecting with people is for the cell process. But again, overall, 88 clarifying objectives in our state standards that bring in the cell process to our classroom. So the good news is you're already teaching with cell. It's not a new thing you have to add or anything else. It's already there. So with that, I have another activity because we're going to delve a little bit more into our cell mapping document and think about what's there in our classrooms and what's there in our curriculums that we're already doing. We're going to look at some examples of, with our lessons and activities and teaching practices and kind of think about and reflect on what it is we can take from this broadcast and start applying right away when we talk about the cell process, either um, with colleagues or with students or how we approach it. So once again, I'm going to have an activity where I want you to choose a cell core competency that you want to follow throughout this next part. There are only five, so just pick the one you like. And here's our activities. As we read through the details about cell from a world language perspective, we're going to have a definition for each of the core competencies from that world language perspective. And we're going to have examples from lessons and activities and the teaching practices components of the document. I want you to look at that carefully. And when you're ready to type in the chat to all, the cell core competency that you've chosen to follow or that you like, and then how you're going to use it in your classroom. You may see some of our examples from the lessons, activities, or teaching practices that you connect with right away, and you may want to share that. Um, you may want to type in, for example, oh, we know when I teach my level one students, we do this already. Or it may give you an idea for something that you want to do or want to alter it a bit to maybe emphasize cell more in your classroom or in a particular lesson that you do or unit that you do with your students. So you're going to feel free to provide course details to help others know what perspective you're coming from. Tell us which language you teach, for example, maybe what level your students are, how old they are, um, or what type of program. One thing I didn't mention before, but I definitely should now, is that, you know, in our World Language Essential Standards, we have clarifying objectives that fit all of our programs, K-12. And so that's true for modern languages, where a language is taught as a separate subject, and it's a language that's spoken somewhere in the world as someone's first language. We have that for our K-12 dual and heritage languages, uh, like with our dual language immersion programs or heritage language courses that used to be called native speakers courses. And we have that for our K-12 classical languages like Latin and ancient Greek, um, which tend to emphasize um, a more classicist approach, meaning that they look at things like ancient civilization culture because their language is no longer spoken as a first language anywhere in the world, but it's still very important to language study. And so, Anything you teach um, is covered in our standards, and there's support for that in the examples that we've selected so that it's evident where that would work in different types of programs for languages. 
All right. And I can see some of you are already sharing in the chat box which cell core competency you want to follow um, and a little bit about why, which is great. Excellent. All right. So remember to follow that, especially as we look at these examples and, and see what that tells you or makes you think about for your own classroom. All right, so when we talk about a world languages perspective, self-awareness has kind of been extended to say learning a new or target language and developing intercultural competence begins with an awareness of self and how individuals are members of their families, communities, and cultures. So it's a little bit as an extension of self-awareness as defined for all self or competencies, but specifically looking at the world languages component. Here are some examples of that from the document. So from our lessons and activities that are done in the target language, one example of a self-awareness lesson would be to have students generate additional vocabulary words that extend their emotions vocabulary. So think about, for example, um, having students be able to share their, their emotions, whether they're happy or joyful or elated. So depending on which proficiency level you're working at, there's all kinds of vocabulary they can add on to or even recycle. It could be important in them extending their proficiency and incorporating cell into their classroom work. Another lesson or activity for self-awareness is to have students reflect on and discuss the different groups they belong to. Um, their family, their school community, their neighborhood community, their state, their country, and specifically how membership in these groups affects how they see the world. This is an important component, of course, of like the community strand and of culture as a standard. But it really helps ground our students from their perspective of where they fit in this world. For teaching practices, the example we've pulled is to routinely give students the opportunity to reflect on what they like to read or what kinds of events, stories, poems, graphic novels, etc. that they prefer. Um, maybe they do that in student pair shares, maybe in journal questions, or maybe in essay questions, depending on how much language they have and what kind of activity you're using in, in their learning environment with them. So that's sort of an overview of self-awareness. There are many, many more lessons and activities as well as teaching practices that are part of the self-awareness component of the document. And I would encourage you to explore those um, and see how they already fit with what you're doing in the classroom. Next up is self-management. And for world languages, um, we start with, with the assumption that all education is based on the fact that students will have the self-management skills necessary to calm themselves and focus their attention so that they can participate in learning, including our world language learning. Also, we assume that world language learning, that students have goal setting skills and can complete academic assignments. So this is something that gets taught everywhere. Here are some lessons or activities, and we've just pulled one or two from our document. Teach students to identify what is known about a lesson topic or objective, and then to identify what they need to know to understand the lesson objective. And this is something we do routinely when we post things like our, our lesson objectives for the day or activities for the day on, on the board or on the, um, the whiteboard, maybe virtually, that students can see. And then maybe how they can set a goal to achieve it using can-do statements um, or linguafolio-like activities um, in the classroom. And many of you are familiar with both of those items, um, but consider that that's how they can work on goal setting. For teaching practices, um, students can be taught, of course, to self-assess their progress toward their learning goals, and they should be. That is a powerful strategy. It empowers them um, with their language learning as well as their academic growth in general. And that should be an instructional routine that they have probably in all classes as they move through grades K through 12, but certainly something we can reinforce in world language education through things like can-do statements and objectives that we share with students. Next up is social awareness, and there's a lot here because obviously we uh, learning language is, is a very social activity in most cases. Um, so when we talk about social awareness, we want to talk about effective communication in writing, in speaking, and in signing. Um, we know obviously American Sign Language or ASL is one of the 18 languages that are taught in North Carolina. So however students are communicating, that depends on awareness of themselves in relation to others, how they're similar, how they're different, and the ability to take the perspective of a target language reader, listener, viewer, um, and understand and be aware of different cultures and experiences, either historical or lived. Um, and I wanna emphasize that, that that comment, historical or lived, um, refers to things like what we would see in K-12 classical languages, 
um, as well as in modern languages. So consider when we think about language education, particularly culture and being aware of society and how it changes over time, um, that can vary over quite a, a span of time because we want our students to have a good background in that for the language that they're learning and the cultures they're learning about. Social awareness also provides an opportunity to understand that people have different perspectives and practices based on those experiences, even within the same language learning or language uh, community. And the perspective taking is an essential part of social awareness. So for our lessons and activities that we do in the target language, we have discussed and analyzed the origins and the negative effects, let's say stereotyping and prejudice as reflected in history, literature, or current and or global events. So again, quite a broad range. And I'm sure you're already thinking about some of the lessons and, and activities you do with students that help them um, get an understanding of this, this perspective and, and different ways to look at that, as well as how you might discuss that using different language skills. For the teaching practices for social awareness, um, we do uh, harken back to things that you're probably very, very familiar with, maybe morning meetings with younger students or class meetings with older students that can be used to involve students in sharing and recognizing others who have different experiences from themselves so they can develop empathy and appreciation for differences and similarities. So that's a, a simple thing to do, but it is certainly involving the self process and, and the, the competency of social awareness. Um, even when you, you're not even thinking that that's what it's doing. So again, something we already do and help them understand as they're learning throughout the day. All right, and I see some people are commenting that they uh, need a like button for all the great ideas being shared. That's certainly true. And I would encourage you um, as we explore this more and as you get access to the cell mapping document, maybe you already have it, that you really look through these lessons and activities and think about uh, what you can use and what you already use in the classroom. All right, let's move on to relationship skills. Our world language curricula um, can be explicitly organized to develop, obviously, communication skills and intercultural competence. That's the purpose of it with our standards-based instruction. But we also involve collaboration, problem solving, and conflict resolution skills. Uh, we incorporate often things like project-based learning, community service or virtual exchange projects, and cooperative learning techniques, because these are all ways for students to practice those important interpersonal communication skills and other skills as well. Some of the lessons and activities um, that we pulled for relationship skills from the cell mapping document include things like lead a community service project so students can practice that communication and problem solving while helping others or learning about the needs of their community. And you certainly don't have to have um, the language that they're learning present in the community, but many times we do. We're a very linguistically diverse state and there are often speakers or signers of the languages that we're learning or we can reach out to other learners of a language, maybe a different uh, course level or class level, maybe um, learners at a different school um, or district. And so there's all kinds of ways to connect with uh, people and to put something like this in practice. For the teaching practices, the example from relationship skills is to give students opportunities to practice social skills in small groups and project-based learning activities either face-to-face -face in the classroom or virtually in that kind of classroom. Um, certainly with the, the tech tools we use today, whether we're in a, an online environment or a physical environment, um, really help us practice the language in different ways and empower our students to practice the language in small groups or even um, in, with a partner. And we can still be um, present later on, listening in on their conversation or viewing their conversation uh, to help them give them feedback and move forward with their language skills. All right, let's move on to responsible decision making. This one uh, for the definition is where world language assumes that students will have the ability to evaluate options and make effective decisions as they complete assignments. Uh, this is also where students have the opportunity to reflect on the values and beliefs of others in the culture, including things like historical figures, characters portrayed in literature and the arts, and members of the local and global community. There's a lot for them to consider, especially given the wide variety of things you can bring into your curriculum as authentic texts and other resources and materials that they can learn from. For our lessons and activities to be done in the target language, we have an example of defining responsibility related terms, things like ethical, safe, values, or honesty, and asking students to write about these words in various ways, appropriate, of course, to their proficiency level and the language that they have. 
A teaching practice for responsible decision making is to use dialoguing techniques that encourage students to think through a systematic process for decision making. So, you know, to say to a student when they're trying to solve a problem, what's the problem? What are your options? What would be the consequences of choosing this option or that option? What are you going to try and why? How will you assess whether your option was a good one? And what will you do if it doesn't work? And again, doing this in the target language gives the students the opportunity to really explore their thinking more deeply and practice their language with you as the teacher or with another peer or a group that they might be working with. All right, so I asked you to choose a cell core competency that you wanted to follow and to then type in the chat why you uh, like that one and how you're going to use it in the classroom. So I'm going to go ahead and turn to our chat now. And Cindy, I'll get you help with this. Let's kind of share out what folks are saying regarding these cell core competencies in the world language classroom um, as a help to others who might get ideas. Maybe you're building off of something we talked about as the lessons or activities or teaching practice, um, or maybe you have one of your own that you know fits well with one of our cell core competencies in world language education. Yeah, there are lots of great ideas that have been uh, entered and some even kind of connected to other uh, academic areas as well, connecting writing with world languages and social awareness um, and comparing cultures was one that was shared. A lot of people included some great ideas with uh, social awareness. Okay. All right. I'm going to take a look. It looks like we've got quite a variety of teachers on the line. I see Spanish, French, Japanese, um, all kinds of languages posted here. Um, there were also some people that said partnering with another student to speak the target language could work on the social awareness and relationship skills. Okay. Um, I'm just going to read some of the options and some of the very practical suggestions we've got. Um, Anna said that she is looking at self-management. So at the beginning of the lesson, ask students how they feel about the topic of the lesson. Could be in a continuum, so like a one to five scale or something like that. And at the end of the lesson, ask students how they feel about it again. So, and feel about it could be anything. How, how confident they feel with it, how much they've learned, that kind of thing. Uh, Melissa said she's been working on relationship skills uh, with her teachers. So she's an administrator, but she's been working on that with teachers and thinking about strategies they can use in the classroom um, to use to build relations with students during remote learning. That's so critical right now because we are connecting with our students in a variety of ways. Um, and sometimes um, the things that we're doing in the classroom, like writing assignments and things like that, can be critical in helping us connect with students as well as helping them learn the language we're teaching. Uh, Amy noticed that she, another thing she started doing this year is having students complete a Google form self assessment um, to go with that self awareness um, about their performance. And part of that is self awareness and part of it is self management as well, kind of assessing their performance and thinking about where they're at. Lisa said um, that her class is doing a project for a neighboring classroom um, since their contact is restricted now in the community. So they're kind of limited on what they can do but they're working with a neighboring classroom so they can reach out. Karen said every morning uh, they ask students how they're feeling today and they ask their partner E2, which means uh, how, how are they doing too? So a Spanish teacher looks like uh, in there. So that's a good morning activity. That's certainly a welcoming and inclusion activity like we talked about it's for the signature practice. Um, we've got Annika who says she recommends for self-awareness for a core competency that Spanish teachers Google search in La Escala de Memes. So look up memes basically in Spanish, I guess. And she said you'll find some great memes on different topics that show people and characters portraying different emotions. Um, and that she has her students share which number is associated with the emoji. Um, that they identify with or with the meme. And that's always a good way to get feedback from students, particularly if you've got um, beginning learners who may not have a lot of language yet, but certainly visuals like a meme or an emoji can help them. Um, emojis are something too that kind of go across different cultures 
Um, a lot of the emojis and, and things that we have here and memes are in fact um, present in other cultures or something very similar. So there's an opportunity there for communication as well as some cultural lessons. Allison says um, that she does a weekly checkout survey with questions like, how are you feeling? Is there anything that you need help with in my class? And she says she's always very surprised by how honest students are on the surveys and the, the feedback they give her on her own teaching. And that's certainly a self-management um, component, um, as well as some other things. They report pulling some other core competencies for the students about their own self-awareness um, and their social awareness within the classroom. And Marie, we've also had a few entered into the Q&A section, um, such as Anna mentioning using responsible decision making during Heritage Month and introductions mm -hmm. with great people. And I was talking about doing activities, analyzing poems in terms of voice, mm -hmm. which connects to self-awareness and the ways we interpret others communication. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, working with poems or any kind of short literature like that, music lyrics, that kind of thing, can be really helpful for students. Uh, first of all, it's short and to the point. Uh, it can be good, obviously, for, for beginning learners in that regard. But it, it can be a way, um, particularly for them to think about emotions in the cell process um, and what a poem sort of packs into it, or what lyrics have that, that packs in the, the message that, that you're trying to convey. All right. Um, I've also got another teacher who says she's a Chinese teacher. I told you there's a lot of a lot of different languages online today. Um, and she said she does a greeting to each student in the beginning of class in Chinese, of course. Also, when she finds students that are pretty quiet throughout the day, she kind of stops and asks how how their day was and gives them three minutes to vent and share their moods with classmates in the chat room. And that can be so helpful for that self awareness and just letting your students have an outlet. For what's happening with them. Uh, we have Anzaya who says she lets students use uh, pictures to share how they feel. And that's a great way to do that. Think about all the access we have to different pictures. You know, um, many of our students have smart devices and they have pictures on their phone, either that they've taken or that they've pulled from the internet somewhere. Again, we get into some memes and other things, but there's always a way for them to express themselves visually that may help support language learning and support the cell process in general. Oh, Annika is sharing that, that she likes to use a music video for Spanish, but she said you could use it um, in any language because you could put a video or um, on silent, of course. Um, but the music video that she likes is called Eres Unico because it shows a story about students in Peru in which some are bullied. And so she asked her students how certain characters feel at certain points. It's a certainly good way to focus in on the emotions of people and the perspective of different people in that situation, in this case, bullying. But you could use this in a lot of ways. Um, I like the idea, too, of using a video on silent because then you have the opportunity for students to use facial expressions and, and gestures and so forth and kind of decide what's being shared here. And how is that the same in uh, cultures uh, or different across different cultures? Because some gestures and, and different things look um, very different depending on the situation. All right. Lots of good ideas here. Thank you for sharing this. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, little activity about, you know, focusing in on cell core competency and, and kind of the lessons and activities and teaching practices that are in the cell mapping document. Certainly, I want you to take more time to see what's there and what ideas and, and brainstorming that might inspire because there's a lot packed in there um, for you to consider for our, our state standards. Well, that brings us, by the way, to our optimistic closure. Um, An optimistic closure as one of the three signature practices is where we do some reflections and looking forward, whether we're working with adult learners or students in the classroom and across the school, that optimistic closure gives us a way to reflect on what we've learned and look forward to what's coming next. Um, one resource for this that I really use quite a bit is the Cell Three Signature Practices Playbook. It's a very extensive book. It is linked on your participants' notes. You can get to the whole thing and download it as a PDF if you would like. All of those resources are free, by the way, on your participants' notes. 
Um, and it's really something to consider because it, it gives you some good ideas to start with for your optimistic closure or for your welcoming inclusion activity. And it also has a lot of um, activities for that second signature practice of pedagogy uh, and engaging activities. But let's do our optimistic closure. This is another poll, but this is a check all that apply this time. I want to know what's true for you right now. Um, based on our broadcast today, could you say I had an aha moment about cell competencies and how I can use that information with adults or students? Could you say you learned something from the broadcast that you can use with language learners soon, maybe this week, uh, next month, that kind of thing? Um, did you, um, are you going to plan to spend some time exploring our cell examples for the World Language Essential Standards document and really finding out what's there that you can use for your particular, um, for particular cell competency or maybe your particular proficiency level that you work with with students? Um, are you going to connect with a colleague um, or maybe more than one colleague about a new understanding of cell and world languages that you have? Are you looking forward to the time change this weekend for that extra hour? Um, I know I recently I remembered or was reminded that our um, daylight saving time switch comes this weekend. So that's coming up and we'll get an extra hour because we fall back in the fall. Or is there something else that's true for you at this moment? And if there is, just check that option and then type whatever it is, the other in the chat to all. So I'll go ahead and run our poll so that you can let us know what's true for you at this moment uh, as our optimistic closure. All right, it should be in your control panel. Please go ahead and click what's true for you, as many as you'd like. All right, finish getting your answers in. It looks like there are a lot of popular options here about what's true for you. All right, I'm showing you the poll results. Hopefully those are visible in your control panel now. And it looks like uh, the most popular one uh, was with almost half of you saying, you're planning to spend some time exploring the, the cell examples for the World Language Essential Standards, and I hope you will take some time to do that. It's always good to stop as, as educators and really take a look at a document or, or some materials that we can use in the classroom and think about how best can I use this or what, what am I already doing here that reinforces I'm on the right path. We also had a number of people um, say that they learned something from the broadcast that they can use with language learners soon maybe before the end of this week or into next month, which of course does in fact start on Monday for us as uh, learners. Um, we had people who also said they had an aha moment about cell competencies and how they can use that information with adults or with students. Um, and they have, we have some folks who said they're going to connect with colleagues um, about a new understanding of cell and world languages, as well as people who are looking forward to that time change this week for the extra hour. Thank you so much for doing our optimistic closure. Um, before we leave, I want to assure you that you will have access to all of this information. So the archives from this broadcast will be posted soon as part of the CELL webinar series. I think you saw maybe um, Cynthia's note to everyone that the NC CELL standards mapping document table that is in your participant notes actually has all the materials from our CELL webinar series and has all of our CELL mapping documents in all content areas. So that's something to really consider as well if you have other colleagues um, maybe from, from different subject areas or from other perspectives who might want that. But all this information will be posted as part of our CELL webinar series. 
And when you leave the broadcast today, you'll get to fill out a brief survey about cell practices and information that we talked about today. So I encourage you to do that. I am also considering adding a cell portion to our World Languages website. And so look for more information uh, soon about that. I need to go back and consult with my cell uh, colleague, the NC Cell Implementation Team, um, and talk about how we might share that um, on our website and have specific information related to cell and world languages. But for now, of course, we have our cell mapping document and our broadcast information. Also, don't forget that since you participate in the live broadcast today of an NCDPI World Language webinar, you have earned one contact hour towards a CEU for license renewal. Um, that will come to you in the form of an email with an attached certificate, probably in about two weeks from today. We may get it sooner, but just in case, give it that two week uh, time frame. Um, also, please note that all local education agencies, whether that's district or charter schools, do have to approve professional development offerings. So that's coming to you soon, um, but that'll be part of our work today. Also, um, here's our last slide. I just want to remind you that our participant notes has everything in there. So be sure to take that document with you. It's just a simple PDF, so you can download a copy for yourself um, on whatever device you choose. And it is always at that bit.ly link you see there. Um, as I told you before, my name is Anne Marie Gunter. I am your World Languages Consultant at the Department of Public Instruction. I get to answer all questions related to our standards and policies and so forth for world languages. You can contact me via email um, or phone that you see there on the screen. And I do encourage all of you to go to our website, the bit.ly slash ncdpiwl. That is where we have all of these materials. I mentioned to you that our, our cell standards mapping document is on the standards tab and resources space on our website. And so I'll just briefly go out to that so we can see it. There's our website. And as you can see, under resources, I'm sorry, under standards, we have all the materials for our standards, including our newest item that you see here, the social emotional learning examples for the World Language Essential Standards. So all of that is there for you um, and more whenever you would like to have that information. All right. Well, we are ending right on time. I thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your great ideas about the cell process in world language education. Uh, we're still enjoying what's in the chat um, and the Q&A from you. And so we'll stay on the line and answer anything else that comes up in those. I also would like to thank Cynthia Floyd, my school counseling colleague, for helping me out today uh, with uh, the behind the scenes of this webinar, as well as Elaine Darby, who has been running our Facebook Live broadcast of this webinar. Um, while we've been doing that. So many thanks to all, and I hope everyone has a great evening um, as we get ready to wrap up October this week and move on into November. I see a lot of thank yous um, in the chat box. Thank you as well. I hope you've got something you can use right away um, and in your classroom with students or share with your colleagues. Um, we're all learning more about cell and, and how important it is, of course, um, not only all the time, but particularly during this time of such transition that we're in. Um, so that, that keeps happening, it seems like, but I think we're adapting as we go and really making a safe space for our students and their learning. Um, in whatever kind of school we're in, a physical school, an online school, or some combination of, of that. And Anne-Marie, will your survey um, pop up automatically once we close the webinar, is that correct? Yes, um, and in fact, when you hit the exit button, that little red button on your control panel with the X, um, and exit the webinar, the survey should pop up automatically. It may pop up in a different tab or something like that, but it should do that automatically. And certainly when we end the webinar, if you're, you're still logged in, um, that will automatically give that to you on your screen.
All right. I think that's a wrap for today. Again, thank you for joining us. We're going to go ahead and end the webinar um, so that our system can start processing the recording and we can get the archives all ready to share with you. Have a wonderful evening.